There's absolutely no way that government intervenes in the lives of people. If you are dying of a congenital disease, for example, you will slowly wither and wither and wither until you die off finally. Well, in terms of asking questions, I don't think we're asking enough questions. In terms of protecting our votes, I don't think we are protecting our votes enough. Those are the two areas I think that the citizens are lacking in. Nigeria is very complex and complicated that, so much so that if Jesus Christ, with apologies to Christians, if Jesus Christ comes down today to Nigeria to say he has arrived, he wants to rule, you're going to have problems. Hi, I thank you for joining us in this video. I'm Obey Ewafo from aclasses.org and we are on a journey for self-improvement. Do you want to improve yourself? Then join us at aclasses.org or subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss any of our uploads. Are you ready? Then let's get started. This evening, we are going to talk about the Nigerian political situation as it affects the citizens. This is actually an interview I did some seven years ago with Festus Kenyamo, a smart and knowledgeable lawyer on the argument. Festus is a senior advocate of Nigeria, political critic, and human rights activist. I did the interview in his residence in Wari, Delta State, and it was about a research I was working on at the time, about the three evils that have befallen Nigeria. One be the then Boko Haram violence insurgents against the non-Muslims in the north and the relatively calm violence campaign in the south, mainly against oil activities by men, movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta. Although the violent campaigns may have subsided in both north and south of Nigeria, the political quagmire and the suffering of the ordinary people has not improved in 2020. In fact, it's worse in some cases. This is why I'm sharing this interview with you this evening. I'm hopeful for you to learn from such a bright mind as Festus Kenyamo. In the concluding part of this video, I will share a thought on the Nigeria electricity problem. Okay then, let's get into the video with Festus and right away. One can also look at it from the angle of how our democracy has developed since 1999. Whether we have made significant improvements, or whether we are still static in terms of democratic development. But let me say that the major issue that is still plaguing us, especially our democracy, is the question of free and fair elections. The people still do not have confidence in the electoral process. And we are still not confident that the product we get at the end of the day is a true reflection of the electoral process that we undergo. People still think that results are falsified, people are imposed upon us, and all of that. The politics of the country is such that we still have a complete disconnect, a major disconnect between government and the people. People do not feel the effect of government on their lives. People still see government as some kind of alien authority, far away from them, that it's pretty difficult for them to get across to. And so, People now resort to self-help. People provide their own water, they provide their own security, they provide their own power in terms of, you know, standby generators and all of that. In terms of um, even, you know, the basic things like uh, food, food and shelter, that in many climes, it is the responsibility of government if you do not have uh, the means to do that, and uh, that is what they call social security in many countries. We still undertake that ourselves. So there's absolutely no way that government intervenes in the lives of people. If you are dying of a congenital disease, for example, you will slowly wither and wither and wither until you die off finally. Nobody will intervene at any point to say there's some kind of health scheme that will take care of you. Even these so-called free health services you hear. A few governments are providing. It's only Panadol and Codeine for your headache and all that. Any major operation or congenital disease, I'm sorry, they don't provide it.
Now in Nigeria, there is an association known as APHPN, standing for Association of Public Health Physicians of Nigeria. In its 2018 statement, issued to mark the World Health Day, reported allafrica.com, poor access to basic health care are responsible for the avoidable illnesses and death that have continued to prevail in the land. That is a statement of real concern. What is even more of a concern is that in 2020, and with nearly 200 million population, Nigeria is still far behind when it comes to affordable health care, not to talk of a free one. That leads me to another question. Are Nigerians really asking the right question to their leaders or worshipping whoever is in the position of authority and able to dish out few changes? Well, in terms of asking questions, I don't think we're asking enough questions. In terms of protecting our votes, I don't think we're protecting our votes enough. Those are the two areas I think that the citizens are lacking in. You get what you deserve as a people. Now, elections are rigged in a brazen manner. Results are falsified. People find themselves in government. Now, instead of you to question the legitimacy of those, of those people, the next minute may be because of poverty or because of the, you know, the lack of the spirit to challenge those things. Everybody like head mentality. Everybody falls into line and say, ah, now the man did it now. Yeah, now then money they move, go meet him now. Now, because of that, the people in government do not have any reciprocal loyalty to the people. Because they feel that they are, they are in government because of certain, certain godfathers. And so they don't have any reciprocal loyalty to you. They have loyalty to the godfathers. That's why you can see people fighting to be chairman of PDP and chairman of parties. Because the moment they become chairman of parties, everybody will go and do rank at day. They, rank. they feel that that is the man who determines whether you get the ticket or not. You see them flooding the mass car with car gifts and all of that. Just go and find out what happens. So, I mean, people like uh, chairman of party of the uh, ruling parties. That is one. The second one is that the people do not ask for accounts when people are in government. In other words, they, are not, they don't ask how their monies are being used or misused. They don't ask how their monies are being spent or misspent. They don't ask how, how, much their, how their monies are being managed or mismanaged. They don't ask. They just feel that the people in government, they see this mentality that the people in government are close to God. And that once they are in government, their decision is the decision of God. So they don't ask questions and, and ask for an account. It's only a few. Of course, you will see, you'll see a few activists here and there like us who do it once in a while. But we expect some kind of mass participation in this kind of thing. If the other time I was questioning the House of Representatives, I'm sure you know, four or five years ago, when I took them on over the, the issue of car purchases in the House of Rep, and they went in they beat me up when I went to the floor of the House to question them, you know. But I was doing more like a solo person at that time. Like solo. I, I expected people uh, and groups to join hands, to, to pour on the streets, to, to do all kinds of things, you know. But I took this almost like a, a solo effort, so much so that uh, they, nearly, they nearly mobbed me, you know, legislators. And I'm sure all of you saw it on TV when they were shouting at me and, you know, it's more on television. So these are the type of things we're talking about. We need to be asking those questions. And I, I expect that um, more and more people will participate in this type of effort. Passion for human rights have also led me to defend across the country, irrespective of tribe and religion, students who have been detained illegally, civil rights activists, journalists, social crusaders across the country, free of charge. All of this free of charge. And I know many of them listening to me across the country can testify to this. And even though I don't believe in a separatist agenda in this country, I don't believe, but that passion for human rights have also led me to even defend separatist leaders. Apart from their vision, their crusade for separatism, I defended them in respect of their human rights alone. Separatist leaders for even 
you know, the rest of organizations like MASOP, like the Biathlon Independent Movement, like the Niger Delta People Volunteer Force. This is actually one of the main reasons why I contacted Festus for this interview. His boldness, and especially in respect to human rights, and in defense of the Niger Delta youths in their violence campaign against oil activities in their land. Of course, you will need to understand the drama of the Nigerian oil industry, the destruction of the Niger Delta ecosystem, one of the largest mangroves and the most diverse ecological reserves in the world. This has been done through the careless operation by the multinational oil companies with the full collaboration of the Nigerian government. To those of you who have a good understanding of Nigeria, you are aware that before the violent campaign in the Niger Delta, some individuals as Ken Sarawewa had earlier came up to protest peacefully against the ecological disaster being created through oil exploration in the Niger Delta. But Ken and his co-peaceful agitators will lose their life on November 10, 1995. We are not going to dig any deeper into that for now. Instead, my question to Festus was, and is still this, both in the situation of the Niger Delta in the south and the religious violence by Boko Haram in the north, could all this be the failure of the Nigerian government to take the young people along? Could it be that the Nigerian youth are easily recruited into violence activities because they are poor, lacking orientation, and cannot find a meaning to their lives? Well, I think that's just a small aspect of it. You may have uh, that factor as a recruiting factor. Recruiting in the sense that those who don't have jobs are easily rec recruited into this course. So it, it plays its own part, but it's not a major factor. But it helps to breed the adherents, the foot soldiers. Because when somebody has a responsible job, you cannot tell me now or tell you that you are trying to make a meaning out of your life, doing, trying, doing all of this you are doing, that you should go and carry a bomb. Nobody's going to convince you. That you should tie a strap a bomb around yourself and go and kill people and kill yourself. So it is those who are poor that they, 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 that they, they feed their, on their minds and they feed ideas into their minds and take them to do and do these this, this things. This thing. And that's why it plays its own, its own role. But the major role, I think, if you ask me, Beyond the facade of religion, beyond the facade of Islam, it's political. It's political. You can not see a situation where even no matter how ridiculous your demands are, when somebody says, okay, come, let, let's talk about it. You say, no, you just keep bombing. But they say, come, let's talk about it. Let's dialogue about this. You say, no. Even Niger Delta militants, when they say, come and talk, and they say, ah, yeah, they drop their arms and say, they went to talk. Because the purpose of violence in fact, the, the politics of violence is that you are only using it not as an end, but as a means to an end. That is the politics of violence. You are only shouting and throwing because you want a certain authority to listen to you. That's the meaning. And so when the authority listens and reacts and says, oh, I've heard your bombs, but come, let's talk. You must talk because that's the reason why you were throwing bombs in the first place. You want to be heard. So I'm not in a situation where somebody is carrying out a campaign of violence, and they say, okay, we have heard your violence. Come and talk. You say, no, we won't talk. Abba, I'm not saying it. Like a small child. Why does a small child rave and rant? Because the child wants something. So when the child is crying and crying and crying and trying, I say, what is wrong with that picking? That's not food he wants. Give him food now. And then you give him food and then there's no cry again. Because the child is not just crying for crying's sake. The child wants something. So that is the thing. So, I expect that having gotten, gotten the offer of dialogue, they should dialogue. Except they want something else. Except they want regime change by violent means, which I will not support. I will only support violence if those people who should call for peaceful change make that peaceful change impossible. If they rig elections, and so... By so doing, they do not subscribe to that peaceful change. Then it is not immoral for me to call for a violent change, for violent protest against those people who do not want peaceful change. It will not be immoral. It will be purely moral for me to use violence to 
thousand. Now, Nigeria as a country has a huge potential, both in terms of human resources, the huge army of young people, and some very intelligent and resourceful ones as such, although it might not appear so on the surface. Then, the abundance of natural resources, good climate, agricultural potentials, and all what it really requires for a people to succeed in today's global market. Yet, we are unable to move beyond such irrelevant obstacles as tribalism, ethnicity, religious affiliation, and more. How? How can we move beyond this pocket of self-created retrogressions and push together towards one direction? What will it take to do that? Nigeria is very complex and complicated that, so much so that if Jesus Christ, with apologies to Christians, if Jesus Christ comes down today to Nigeria to say he has arrived, he wants to rule, you're going to have problems. First of all, you will have problems from those who are non-Christians. Even whether he's doing well or not, they'll say, ah, this is this, suspicious, this is suspicious, this is suspicious, this is Jesus Christ, he wants to turn the whole nation into Christians. So you have a problem first. Without even looking at his work. If the other way around, you have, you know, somebody come down, the head of the Muslim religion come down to say, we want to, the first thing, the Christians will say no. The Christians will say, no, 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 no. This is an attempt to Islamize everywhere. So there will be, there's a problem. People put sentiments and other above performance in Nigeria. They just look at you and say, you are not my man. You are not my area. You are not my this. So, and that is one of the major causes of our retrogression. Major causes of our retrogression. We are not looking for who can develop our country. We are looking for who is our brother or sister to lead us. And that's our problem. The country is not moving. You see a very competent, qualified hand. They'll say, no, sorry, it is not his turn, or he's not a Muslim or Christian. Or he's not a northern of this thing or southern. And that's the reason why he cannot get the job. Because that slot is reserved for Urumi man. That slot is a slot of an Igbo man. This is the way we are today. That's I'm telling you, that's the problem. They're the most insane from a Christian Muslim point of view. Well, this is one of the points of view. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the point of view now. <laughs> oh. Let me put on the big generator. Suddenly, the light went out as I was asking some of my last questions. And that should not be surprising, considering what we have discussed so far. But why? Why should something as important to the progress of any country as light, electricity, be a mystery in Nigeria even as we talk? Have you heard of some people say such things as fasting and praying for electricity in Nigeria? Have you seen some Nigerian political leaders who are basically incapable of the mathematical calculations of how much megawatts of electricity is needed to power the size of the Nigerian economy? This is what I'm talking about. Does it have to be a mystery? Now, it was an Italian physicist, Alessandro Volta, who discovered a particular chemical reaction that could produce electricity. And that was in the 1800. He constructed the voltaic pi, an early electric battery that produced a steady electric current. And so he was the first person to create a steady flow of electrical charge. Of course, Alessandro Volta did not invent the whole concept of electricity. The idea had been floating around since the ancient time, especially if you consider how much people have been trying to improve themselves by carefully observing nature and try to replicate the occurrences in different ways. However, I would like to stick to Alessandro Volta with his important improvement in the development of electricity. Since the 1800s, it would take less than 50 years before more houses and industries would light up in Western countries and beyond. Thanks to other individuals who later improved on the idea of electricity, like Thomas A. Edison, who reinvented the incandescent light bulb and make it ready for commercial consumption. What I'm here telling you is that 
In 2020, it's almost illogical that a country like Nigeria, with all its potential, cannot provide electricity to power its economy. Whereas, all that it really needs to have a stable electricity in Nigeria is for the government to really want electricity. I mean, sincerely going for it, instead of massaging the mind of the population with some irrational excuses. If we are to think just a little bit, then I will come up with a few more questions. How can a country grow in darkness? How can we find a solution to our electricity problem if we don't even believe that we can do it, despite the thousands of electrical engineers the country produces every year? And especially that they do not need to invent electricity, but simply copy what is already available for hundreds of years. And the government will, of course, pay for the experiment to make it happen. Am I making any sense here? I know. The political leader rather organized monumental entourages and pilgrimages to Mecca and Jerusalem to pray. We are a nation that pray to a deity in the sky so he can come to resolve our problem for us. Why our brain is frozen in a refrigerator, is it it? If as a country we are ready to get electricity, and it is true that we don't already have competent electrical experts to champion the Nigeria Electricity Project, then let the government send young electrical engineers to the most advanced countries of the world to study. The only solution to the problem is to study our way out. On the alternative, we shall keep entertaining ourselves as to why we are where we are, or maybe blaming whoever we choose to. That is entirely our choice. With that, I want to say thank you to Professor Kenyamo, a senior advocate of Nigeria. Thanks also to you, the viewers who have accompanied us in today's journey. I remain Obey Airwanful from aclasses.org. Until next week, keep working more on yourself than you do on your job. Bye for now.